Wormenjika. And that's an Aboriginal word for down here in the Bunurong and Bunurong country in Southeast region. It means welcome and welcome to this presentation. My name is Auntie Helen Bernads and I'm the elder and the cultural lead for Peninsula Health. And Peninsula Health is one of the major health providers here in the southeast region from Frankston and also Mornington Peninsula. I can do an acknowledgement to country because I am not from this country. I am not a traditional owner. I am a, what they call a Murray, a traditional owner from up in Queensland. How I introduce myself tribal way is I am a berry gubber from the Bindle Group and I have direct family ties into the Cherbourg Aboriginal Mission and also into another traditional mob up there in Queensland, the Waka Waka. I have been down here for 50 years and uh, with respect to the Koori mob who have looked after me, I've worked and lived in this area. So I can do an acknowledgement to country, which I will do now on behalf of Peninsula Health. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners, the Bunurong peoples and the Bunurong peoples, and the wider nation here in Victoria of the Kulin Nations. I'd like to pay my respects to those elders past and present, and to the young ones, the emerging ones. I would also like to mention and pay my respects to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who do not come from this area but have travelled from all around Australia. I acknowledge them and welcome them into this presentation and into this country. How I will run this presentation, so you will know, is firstly I'll be talking about the traditional Aboriginal Australia then I'll give the perspective of Europeans. Then later, I'll let you know what's happened on the missions and reserves. And I will then give you the timeline of significance of political events that has happened here in Australia. Lastly, I will be zeroing back into Peninsula Health and letting you know what we do there with the Aboriginal Hospital Liaison Officers, painting you a picture of the local communities and looking at the Peninsula Health Reconciliation Action Plan. In traditional Aboriginal Australia, pre-colonisation, there supposedly was approximately 380,000 people and a half a million people, 250 languages, and approximately 250 dialects from those languages. All those different groups from each state was different. There isn't a uniform Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander peoples in our country. There was a different totanic belief system there was a different way of dance, art, and of kinship. Not everyone was hunters and gatherers. There is plenty of evidence to support that there were stone houses, particularly built here in Victoria, where people stayed over a period of time. So what we have is traditional foods eaten. We have dance, we have a strong men's business, women's business, rights happening amongst the youth, the separation, the marriage groups, the children being taught their local belief system to what to believe and where to go. This all changed when the mass colonisation took place. So you had all these Aboriginal groups around Australia taking care of country, renewing and revitalising their spirituality through dance, through art and through celebrations and meeting up with other specific Aboriginal groups from around their area. You can guess what happened 
on the mass colonisation of here in Australia. From the European perspective, what we had over there globally, away from Australia, was a belief system of terra nullius. What that meant legally and politically was, for those invaders, it meant if the land seemed to be emptied, then it was legally okay to take the land. What was happening in the European context was also a belief system about two things. Darwinism, and that was from Charles Darwin and from a biology perspective, that the strongest in a group survive through evolution. Coupled with that was a Christian belief system of a great chain of being. At the top of the ladder, there was a white god and you went through different other human groups until you reached the bottom, where at the bottom were plants and animals, but also black-skinned people were right down the bottom of the great chain of being. Those at the bottom of the ladder, it was believed, needed to be saved. The European way of believing in the land was on that land. You toil the land, you built buildings, you chop down trees, completely different to what was happening in Aboriginal Australia. The people who came in the mass colonisation was primarily white males and they were convicts. There were very few women. The mass colonisation also meant that they brought farm animals, sheep and cows and other plants. What they brought tragically into Aboriginal Australia was diseases, primarily smallpox, measles, sexually transmitted diseases. There were a lot of massacres all around Australia. There was a lot of frontier wars where Aboriginal people were outnumbered by the guns, the rifles, the gunpowders taking over the land from Aboriginal people. So you can imagine what happened. What to do now with the remnants of so many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander groups. There was another philosophy, and it was a belief that smooth the pillow of the dying race. What do we do with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? Very quickly, through legislation in Australia, to put in the Aboriginal Protection Acts. This was under the umbrella, the 1901 White Australia policy that the government put in place. Aboriginal people were forcibly, forcibly removed from their cultural lands, from their own countries, and placed in what they call missions or reserves in every state of Australia. The conditions on the missions and reserves, in a large case, was pitiful. The Aboriginal parents were not in charge of their children. It was the Director of Native Affairs who were able to take the children, remove them from their parents, and in a lot of cases, the young Aboriginal males went up and worked in the pastoral stations and the young females into domestic service. In the majority of cases, those young people, those Aboriginal people who were in employment, they were not paid. They were working under slave conditions and it was known as the stolen wages. On the missions and reserves, you were not allowed to marry the person of your choice. There was minimal educational 
facilities and minimal health care for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. The food was now into processed food. Some Aboriginal people, predominantly Aboriginal males, if they spoke up, and I know in Queensland many did, well they were shipped off immediately from their families on the missions and reserves and taken to a harsh penal colony near Townsville called Palm Island. And there they stayed. That was their punishment. But also it was the punishment, if you do not behave, we will remove your children. Across the waters from Palm Island was a leprosorium. For punishment, still further, some of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and youth were then taken over to the leprosorium, even though they never had leprosy. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the missions and reserves were again devastated when the police were used to remove Aboriginal children from their families and if they were taken away and into hospitals, social workers and nurses were used also to remove children. So this has had a lasting effect until now. On the missions and reserves, those who were, and I hate the terminology, but half-castes, were given the option of obtaining an exemption certificate. Aboriginal people referred to them as a dog tag, a dog licence. We will give you an exemption certificate, but this is what happens. Of course, you have the freedom. You can drink alcohol, you can live outside the community, you can get a job, you can marry who you want. You can go for a job which you want out in the community. But what was the setback here? With all those other conditions, the setback was you are to give up your Aboriginality. You are no longer able to mix with your Aboriginal families. You are no longer able to come onto the missions and reserves. That was the dog tag, the exemption certificates. Some Aboriginal people did go down that pathway. And I have found that later, their children and grandchildren are coming back to say, we would like to come back into the Aboriginal community and to claim our descent heavy with the legislation, with the Aboriginal Protection Acts. Aboriginal people complied the best way they could and in doing so, many lost their language, their identity, their cultural beliefs. Further, the Australian legislation meant that they brought in four distinct periods of legislation for Aboriginal people, leading right up into the 1970s. What you had was the protection era, then assimilation. Assimilation is if you had, again, white blood, other blood, you come under the Assimilation Act. Integration period, and lastly, you had the management period, the self-determination, starting from the 1970s until now. What we have, there were significant events in Australia's history where Aboriginal people and non-Aboriginal people came on board for the benefit of Aboriginal people. Again, we see the reconciliation taking place. So like in the 1967, the referendum, it was not only about getting the vote. Over 90% of Australians in six states said yes. Well, they voted for Aboriginal people to be counted on the census 
but also that Aboriginal affairs be taken over by the federal government. Previously, in all the states of Australia, the individual governments were looking after Aboriginal affairs. This all changed in 1967. In 1983, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander identification was legalised in the High Court. So to be an Aboriginal person, there is a three-part slogan, and that is of dissent for Aboriginal people to identify, and thirdly, to be accepted by the community in which they live. Having a confirmation of Aboriginality certificate, a piece of paper, is very difficult for some Aboriginal people. What happens, and this is the question, what happens when you're removed from your family, you're institutionalised, fostered out, and then later, even 50 years down the track, you haven't got a confirmation of Aboriginality, where do you go? Down here in the southeast region, one of the Aboriginal gathering places, what happens is they come and become members of that Aboriginal organisation. They give service. They speak to someone within the organisation who can then trace as much as they can their Aboriginal ancestry. We have that piece of paper. We can take it right back through the family tree as much as we can. And then once all the documentation is gathered as much as we can, it then goes towards a board meeting and the board stamps off on that person being an Aboriginal person for themselves and their children. And that brings a lot of closure for Aboriginal people whom at last feel like they can rest their spirit and say honestly that they're an Aboriginal person through that paper. In 1987 was the Royal Commission into black deaths in custody. 99 Aboriginal people who were in police custody and had dealings in the prison also, their lives were dissected and from a perspective of their childhood, from a social, emotional, well-being perspective, their lives dissected to see what had brought them into the prison system, what had happened here out of the Royal Commission into Black Deaths in Custody. There were 339 recommendations over 30 years ago. Very few of those recommendations have been put in place. Following the Black Deaths in Custody report, the government then put in place the Reconciliation Act. So that 10-year plan was about actively putting out in the Australian community programs of education for non-Aboriginal people to let them know about Aboriginal history and culture. There were very strong movements of good non-Aboriginal people coming on board, realising what had happened here in Aboriginal Australia, thinking it unjust, and then coming out in the streets to support Aboriginal people, and then to make a movement, a very strong movement, the Reconciliation Movement of Australia. From the Reconciliation Action Movement in 1991, then came in 1993 the overturn of Terra Nullius. There was a person called Eddie Marbo from the Torres Strait Islands and a group of his friends who took 10 years of going through the legal system to say our traditional cultural beliefs and languages is still practised on the Torres Strait Islands. And the Torres Strait Islands is on the top of Australia. There are five main islands. 
Terra Nullius was overturned in what they call the Mabo case, which gave Aboriginal people native title and land rights here in Australia. After Mabo, in 1995, there was the creation of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander flags. It was legally recognised by the federal government as a flag of Australia. So the Aboriginal flag has black at the top for the people, the red for the earth, and in the middle is a circle which is recognised as the sun and the sun and the source of hope. The Torres Strait Islander flag was designed by a 15-year-old Torres Strait Islander person. So it has the colours of the green for the land, the blue for the sea, because the Torres Strait Islanders are seafaring people. They have two black stripes for the Aboriginal people of the Torres Strait Islands. And in the middle of the Torres Strait Islander flag is a white dari or traditional headdress. There is a five-pointed star, a star also on the Torres Strait Islander flag that used to guide the seafaring Torres Strait Islanders. In 2007, we have what they call close the gap. There was great concerns about the health of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here in Australia, about also the low education qualifications. Not many were getting through education, starting from kindergarten right up, and those who were not completing year 12. There were lots of other concerns too. From that time, it was a very poor performance of hardly any improvement in regards to close the gap measures until this year in 2021 there are now four new priorities of what close the gap looks like. The four priority areas are about responsibilities with other organisations primarily working in partnership with Aboriginal communities and non-Aboriginal communities. And that every state and territory will now be reporting individually about their report on Close the Gap, instead of just leaving it up to the federal government. Regarding Aboriginal health, and the present picture of what it looks like. Aboriginal males and female Aboriginal people, with the males it's about 10 years below what non-Indigenous males are living to. Approximately the same with Aboriginal females and non-Indigenous females. Our health concerns are greatly diabetes, respiratory and cardiac conditions. Smoking is also high up there. Intergenerational massively. Grief and loss from the past is carried on. In that picture, the health picture is also high self-harm and mental health issues. Combined with, for Aboriginal people in our area, homelessness and high rates of incarceration and low education qualifications and unemployment. In 2008, and here in Australia, the Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, made an apology. We apologise for the laws and policies of successive parliaments. To the stolen government. generation, those Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who were forcibly removed from their families and the communities. What he apologised for was the legislative 
processes that took children from their families and communities and for the pain that they suffered and are still suffering, still suffering intergenerationally. Those who are removed, who do not know in full their Aboriginal identity or culture. In 2017, we had the Statement of the Heart from Uluru. Over 250 people, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and others, gathered at a convention in Alice Springs. What they were calling for was to be involved and to be a part of the constitution of Australia and for a makarata or an agreement or a coming together of people legislatively to have a voice in what has happened here in Australia, the truth-telling. Truth-telling and treaty. And here in Victoria, the first stage, there was the Treaty Act of 2018 which gave permission for traditional owners who were voted in by the community to represent them, to have a voice in the Victorian government in regards to what the treaty process will look like. That is still current. I'll now zero in on our state. There is believed population-wise from the ABS, which is the Australian Bureau of Statistics, that was done in about 2016. There is approximately 4,500 Aboriginal people in Victoria. In the southeast region, there is approximately 2,500 people, Aboriginal people. When Aboriginal people come into the hospital, I will say like Peninsula Health, like Frankston Hospital, it is mandatory that the ward clerks ask the identity question. Are you an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person or both? That sets in motion a call for the two Aboriginal hospital liaison officers who work at Frankston Hospital to go and see this Aboriginal person, patient or client who's come into the Peninsula Health System, who asks the question is primarily the ward clerks, the identity question. In some cases, Aboriginal people, particularly those who are white skinned, blue eyed or blonde, or don't know their history or shamed up to now of stating that they're Aboriginal people, will say no. Until later, if they are admitted, they will see the staff and say to them that they're an Aboriginal person, we would like to see the Aboriginal hospital liaison officer. In every state of Australia, there should be in the major hospitals an Aboriginal hospital liaison officer, also known as a cultural broker. They are there to support Aboriginal people culturally, but also to work side by side with the doctors and the nurses and other allied health members in the hospital for the best possible care for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander patient. To be culturally safe in a hospital, and that means for Aboriginal people very cautious about coming into a big organisation, very cautious about dealing with social workers and the police and others who have removed children. They're apprehensive and vulnerable. If the Aboriginal hospital liaison officer is involved, they are involved from a community level and there to support the best clinical health plans that can be in place for Aboriginal people. There is a high rate of Aboriginal people leaving the hospital, being just walking out, 
discharged without medical advice or medical permission. Just had enough, but you can understand that. But if those Aboriginal people have the support of a liaison officer, it's a different story. To be culturally safe up at Peninsula Health, we have not only the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander flags flying, we have Aboriginal art all within the hospital. That Aboriginal art has come from an Aboriginal organisation called Torch, which is ex-offenders and prisoners. We purchase, Peninsula Health purchase their art and then place it on the walls of the hospitals. And we know that the money goes directly back to those prisoners. Later, in the Reconciliation Action Plan, the third for Peninsula Health, where there is a high emphasis on employment for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people within Peninsula Health, ex-offenders, appropriate ex-offenders, will also be included in that list for employment and further education within our organisation. Within Peninsula Health, we have what they call the ballot ballot reconciliation bus tours. So approximately about five years ago, the non-Aboriginal staff came to me and said, Auntie Helen, we know that there's Aboriginal organisations here locally, but we're embarrassed to even go in. It seems disrespectful. We would like to go in. So what I did was I went around to the major Aboriginal organisations in our area, which are Willamarang Aboriginal Gathering Place at, down at Hastings, here at Bunjawara, which is a 12-bed rehabilitation youth organisation and healing centre for Aboriginal youth, some who have been caught up in the prison system. I went to the Frankston gathering place called Jambana, Naramar Jambana, spoke to them and got their permission in regards to the ballot ballot tours and went to Ballock Arts up in Mornington, which is an Aboriginal owned and run creative arts centre. We are now dealing with the Kui Cafe in Rosebud, which is again Aboriginal owned and run, and that economic hospitality centre. So on the ballot ballot tours, which people have to go on a waiting list, the Peninsula Health staff, to go on the waiting list and then with organisational um, permission from the gathering places, we take people around on the bus. It took six months through the consultative process to get this happening. So our cultural awareness is alive. The staff of Peninsula Health are seeing this, what's available out there. Also within Peninsula Health, we actively actively celebrate things like Reconciliation Week in May, NAIDOC Week in July. And NAIDOC Week just didn't start overnight. It commenced in 1938 in Sydney with over a thousand protesters out in the streets, non-Aboriginal people supporting Aboriginal people for Aboriginal rights. It was called the Day of Mourning. So from Reconciliation Week, Sorry Day, NAIDOC Week, we invite non-Aboriginal people to come along to our celebrations. I would like to sincerely thank Bunjilwara here at Hastings for hosting this presentation. And I would greatly encourage all non-Aboriginal people to join in at Reconciliation Week in May and NAIDAC events. Join in in enthusiasm for Uluru the Statement. Join in for sharing the information, not only that you now hold, but also to spread it amongst your family 
and friends to give non-Aboriginal people an inkling into what's happened here in Australia, that Australia does have a black history. <laughs>